here on a captain's log. Now you can watch several behind the scenes tours of the Enterprise D bridge from Star Trek Picard with the designers and the next generation mm -hmm. cast. Now this includes videos offering a closer look at the bridge of the iconic Enterprise D that was recreated for the final episodes of Star Trek Picard. There's also some board concept art. Ooh, it's a little nostalgic to see the bridge like that. <laughs> it does make you nostalgic, doesn't it? And speaking of nostalgia, our favorite acting ensign Wesley Crusher, played by Will Wheaton on Star Trek The Next Generation, hosts this 180 degree Enterprise D bridge tour on Paramount+. Plus. Now, you can also watch a 39-minute production of this on the Paramount Plus YouTube page. Just about everything that you love virtually about Star Trek The Next Generation was designed by Michael Okuda, now the scenic artist and graphic designer of futuristic computer consoles, Michael Okuda, joins host Will Wheaton because they take you back through all the little and big details of the Enterprise D bridge. Now, the video is called Touring the Enterprise D and has been replicated to be a new set for Star Trek Picard, looking exactly like the famous set as the home of numerous talented Star Trek performers. Interviewing a number of talented performers on this show has taught us that going in early for makeup as a Klingon is only the beginning to a long production day. Whether you're speaking English or Klingon or anything in between, like Klingon proverbs and Shakespeare. I offer a toast. The undiscovered country. The future. The undiscovered country. Hamlet, Act 3, Scene 1. You have not experienced Shakespeare until you have read him in the original Klingon. Mary Chifo has done it all, and we are delighted to have her join us here on a captain's log. Scream. interview. Now, oh, Mary, much influence. How much influence did your parents inspire you both in the entertainment industry here in Los Angeles? Uh, Michael Chifo and Beth Grant are your parents. They were both successful actors. How much did they have on your decision? How much bearing did they have on the decision for you to pursue acting? And was it something that they pushed you towards or did you gravitate towards it on your own? Additionally, what advice or pointers did they give you when you first were entering into the industry? I really love, uh, I always love telling my acting origin story it, as both my parents, yeah, being working wonderful character actors. I grew up around them being, you know, going to auditions and dressing up as doctors and lawyers and whatever else. And so truly in my mind, up until about fourth grade, I thought that everyone was an actor. <laughs> <laughs> that like everyone was pretending to be their occupation. Like it, it, like a friend's mom was a lawyer. I'd be like, yeah, and then you come home and then you're just mom. <laughs> and it was like, there, I, there was some conversation I had with some classmate where it just like, clicked that I was like, no, her mom's actually a lawyer. My mom auditioned to be a lawyer last week and is not, <laughs> that is not the same thing. <laughs> and, cool. uh, but that was around the time that Eve, my best friend, I, I alluded to earlier, uh, you know, we're going to Comic-Con, we're loving all these different like fantasy novels and movies and stuff. And, uh, uh, uh <laughs> um, Eve had a camcorder and, uh, we just started filming our imaginary games essentially. 
um, and uh, just kind of built from there. We were always sisters with British accents in slightly magical scenarios. Uh, <laughs> And uh, it was, you know, it was beautiful and wonderful. And then we do a school play. My parents were encouraging of me being all that I wanted to be and being creative. They didn't certainly didn't push me into acting, uh, but they also never were like, you don't want to do this. And I actually had an experience early on. It, this is I'm just going to tell that my mom had auditioned for Titanic. The casting directors, she obviously did not did not get the part. Um, <laughs> But the casting director said, hey, there's this little girl that we need at the end. It, there's like where he uses the girl to get on the boat yeah. or whatever. And they were like, do you think, I, we know you have a young daughter who's right around the age. Do you think that's something she might want to try? And my mom was like, well, let's see. You know, like, again, not pressuring, not doing yeah. anything. Just said, Mary, would you want to do what mama does? And I was like, okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, I went in and I'm very protective of my imaginary worlds, which is why, you know, I've come to share it with others but at the time they were like okay you can't find your mom and you're really upset and i was like no my mom's right there kind of thing. and they were like okay uh and uh, then we got, had my mom go out of the room and they're like okay let's try that again and i just was not having it and she was like now you're gonna cry and i was like wah, wah, wah. like i just was like i don't want to give you my vulnerability yeah <laughs> um but apparently when we came home i said mom you act i'll be a kid and <laughs> And so I kind of, that was, I think the mentality that I then took, I was like, well, everyone acts eventually, but right now I'm just going to be a kid. But because of that, my mom definitely wanted to respect where I was there. And I think it allowed me to have an expansive imaginary childhood. And I went to a Waldorf school for elementary school, which is very like kind of alternative education, like knitting and, and woodwork and just a, a different way of kind of getting into education. And so throughout all of this, my parents are going great, cool. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we love it too. And of course, I'm growing up around other creatives, other actors, um, directors, you know, people seeing how wonderful it is. And again, growing up in the Valley, which I still haven't left. We're in Burbank now, Manny Lee. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> love Burbank. Uh, yeah, it's a great spot. It is. Um, but uh, growing up adjacent to, I say, the chaos, like we're over the hill. So, like, there's, there's, this idea of Hollywood and there's definitely like, you know, wherever you come from, however you pursue a career, it, there is this, there's, a, there's a toxic element to the industry, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, and I felt that I was made aware of that, but also shown that that's not all that the industry is and that there are great artists out there who are doing the work and there is great theater in LA. And, you know, I just feel really grateful that that was part of my exposure that then motivated me in my acting to want to do the work, to want to have a technique. Now, for those who don't know, Mary graduated from the Juilliard Drama Program. Now, Mary, what was that like? And you, can you share some stories or any stories about your training during your time at Juilliard? This is where it's all gonna keep tying in because my dad actually went to Juilliard. Uh, he was in group six and I ended up, when I auditioned, got in, all this sort of stuff, more on that, but I was in group 44. So he was there, quite near the beginning when the school had the reputation it did for being <laughs> quite intense. It, it's still quite intense, but uh, definitely a different vibe uh, now. <laughs> you know, again, even with that, with Juilliard, we were visiting New York as a family because that's where my parents kind of came of age in general. My dad's from Long Island. And my dad said, would you want to tour the school around the time I was going to start looking at colleges? And so I kind of went, okay, sure. But he wasn't pushing me in that direction, nor was he telling me not to go, even though he had you know, not a perfect experience. I mean, it was <laughs> hard not to be somewhat traumatized by any conservatory program. Um, so I got to enter it really in a place of like, is this the right fit for me? And uh, I really found that it was. It was when I toured and researched it more, I just kept going, yeah, this is so how I like to work because I was very academically rigorous and uh, passionate and I loved art history. That was another um, thing that I fell in love with in high school. I was fortunate enough that they had an art history class as an elective, and I got really into that. Um, ended up doing an independent study, Women, Art, and Power for my senior year, no surprise. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's a whole other interview conversation. Um, but I just kept, when I was looking at programs, I kept going, yes, I think a conservatory, like a nine in the morning till 10 at night, like just immersed in classes, voice and speech, movement, um, and especially 
again, and this does tie into like, you, like the Juilliard training contributing to my work on track is that I've always been a very physical vocal person and that sort of training really appealed to me and I think we can get trapped in like the post Brando method idea but I even think like you look at him he's extremely physical I think we often get like if you don't if you're not feeling it here first you can't physicalize it yeah. and I love that so much of the Juilliard training is this outside in that you create a shape um and then you find out what it means. Aliza Pearl, who took me to see the show that you were in, Lily, who is also a Klingon in many ways, was <laughs> Maddie's roommate and did an improv truck show. And that is the seed of our origin story as friends and then to love us long, long, long after that. Um, but anyway, uh, the thing about long form improv that I was trying to say about with the Juilliard training, <laughs> there was a through line here. Um, Klingon physical outside in with the um, improv talking about how you start with an emotion, you start with a shape, you start, you don't know who your character is, but it doesn't make it inauthentic. If you're coming from a truthful place, you'll find out. And so that's been a cool muscle exercise in a different way. Obviously with all my Juilliard plays and, and Trek, that is very scripted. And, and, right. and yet I, you know, in those movement classes, in uh, the voice and speech classes, it's like, yeah, how does the sound affect who you are? We saw that you enjoy Shakespeare, and I do as well, along with many Star Trek alums. How did you become interested in the spear? With Shakespeare, um, you know, not being afraid to be all that you are, and that actually the sounds inform character. And there's um, it, actually from this improv training, impro, um, they talk about first, second, and third circle, which is a whole uh, thing that Patsy Rodenberg speaks to, who's a great teacher. But the general premise is first circle is kind of rescinded into yourself. Third circle is the person at the party who's talking at everyone and no one. Uh, and second circle is when you're truly present with the other person and responding. And of course, as an actor, you can play a first or second or first or third circle character, but you have to be in second and be present so you can respond. Mm -hmm. And this is true in life, too. Yes, yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, but um, I think that that's just such a core th core thing. And in my training, the words that I was given in my time at Juilliard was more on Alexander technique, like Alexander technique, which is another sort of kinesthetic uh, thought and movement um, energy uh, technique, uh, along with Shakespeare and how those are like the, the biggest through lines, I would say, in the Juilliard education. That's what you do kind of consistently throughout the four years. And then a lot of other wonderful stuff in between. Um, but again, that the expanse of the character that often Shakespearean characters, or we see a lot of third circle performances where people are, I am saying a thing. <laughs> Proclamation. And again, yeah. yeah, you can play that character, uh, but if it's from a second circle place or in Alexander technique, a very like present, um, flow state. Do you feel that performing Shakespeare has provided any advantages in taking on a role like Chancellor Laurel? And so I feel like all of that really did cater and lead towards what I was able to imbue into Laurel. I'd like to believe that that was something I'm capable of regardless of the training, but I spent four years, you know, going from class to class and, and learning how to embrace imperfection and, and know that there were innate skills that I had that I could pull out. So when I did get picked up at 3.40, 2 a.m. Uh, or have a, you know, a 20 hour day and my sweat was sloshing in my ears when I'm having an intimate scene with Tyler, there is a technique that you pull out and that, you know, the work will out. So I am very grateful again for all the time that I got because my parents just were very encouraging when they, whenever they saw me passionate about something, uh, they encouraged it. And I also played soccer, which also again catered to, I'm sure the Klingon stuff. I was a goalie. So I was very willing to throw myself about, um, uh, but I am very grateful that that's, you know, was always the dynamic with my parents. And it's been so fun to continue to celebrate that. And like I said, you know, they watched the Nichelle Nichols interview uh, recently. And it's just, you know, they're extremely supportive and, it, and, you know, always made it clear that they understood why I love it. They also, you know, didn't shy away from being like, hey, here's a painful moment that I'm having because mm -hmm. I really wanted this role and I didn't get it. Or I did get this role and I'm ch being challenged by it. Um, but I think at the core, it all comes from deep passion. 
um, which again is those are the people that I surround myself with, and I do feel very grateful to have a partner in love and 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 life and and art. There's <laughs> something who you know feels the same way, and and again getting with every morning is the short film um someone like aaron who takes on the mantle of that lead producer and really cares deeply and has a different skill set that thank goodness like again it's like so many different people come in and and care about a story and make it happen which again was a huge part of the juilliard training was it was we're here to tell a story well how are we in service of the play how are we in service of the playwright how do we you know honor what was set forth and especially with the classics and again, talking a little more on my Shakespeare love, which, you know, my other kind of huge project that I've done since Trek has been this adaptation of Othello with a gender and color conscious casting. And I won't go full in depth to that, but most recently we, we created an app called Iago the Green-Eyed Monster in collaboration with Verizon. The creative producer is Juvie Productions, which is Viola Davis and Julius Tennant's production company, Juilliard alum. It really does all tie together. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Viola is a, you know, esteemed uh, Juilliard um, alum and her book, Finding Me, if you haven't listened to it it's yeah and listen to it because it's her narrating it it's excellent um but you know their their whole company of course is championing uh giving voice to the voiceless inclusivity diversity in its truest form uh not for any reason other than true empowerment and respect uh for our all marginalized groups who deserve to have their voices heard um but being able to create this app that is a reimagining of Iago as a woman, uh, because of an experience I had of playing Iago. I played a lot of Shakespeare male roles uh, at school. I played King Lear and then Macbeth in my fourth year. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, particularly when I was doing Macbeth, because that was, I was just fully carrying that show. Um, I was like, oh, when you're the protagonist, as you know, a male role is given. Uh, the last Shakespeare I had done before that was Queen Elizabeth in Richard III, which is a great role and one of, you know, a really great female role in Shakespeare. But the time I had off stage was a lot. <laughs> and and not even like, I want more time on stage, but Richard III, the actor playing Richard III, he's just on stage and processing. Like that's a whole different experience as an actor when your, your arc is being shaped like, and I spoke to this with having Sonequa as our lead. That's the representation. Like when you put a black woman as the protagonist, you get to go on this journey with her. And she as an actor gets the experience of constantly being on screen right. and constantly dealing with things. That's just, it's just different. With Queen Elizabeth, I had to have some very intense emotional stuff go on, uh, but would spend like 45 minutes off stage and kind of have to again, as actors do, create that for myself and then come on stage and have it. But then when I did Macbeth, I was like, oh, <laughs> I'm just having to respond to what's in front of me. Yeah, again, I just feel so fortunate that, again, all of the training, all of the different opportunities, whether it be Juilliard or Trek, has empowered me to create spaces that are also, you know, giving voice to something very important to me. Like playing Iago as a woman is extremely important to me um, and empowering to me. Uh, and I did, it's animated, the the app is an animated, but we did get to record it in XN suits, so kind of mocap. So I got to embody the character and I sing the song. So it was just so cathartic to kind of get some of those words out. And we use lyrics that are based off of the text from Shakespeare. And that to me is like where I hope we are with Shakespeare, is that there's we're in a reinvention that will then bring its power back and bring, it, bring the power of it, you know, getting rid of the elitism. Mm -hmm getting rid of the hierarchy that's been created about who can do Shakespeare and how you can do Shakespeare. I think we all can. And the stories are innately human. I mean, that was always the point. And also very, very Klingon. <laughs> <laughs> Because you haven't, what is it? You haven't heard Kling, uh, you haven't heard, heard Shakespeare, Shakespeare in, until you've heard it in Klingon. I love that exactly. line. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, wow. We, I see. Yes. Look, I did all that. <laughs> I love characters that live in the gray, um, that are making choices based on the circumstances rather than what is deemed to be right by their society. And then, of course, as a huge feminist, just her arc coming from the shadows into the light. Uh, up against this patriarchal system and the Klingon Empire is such a gift because the Federation is 
you know, allegedly past that. We still see the nuances of how <laughs> misogyny and other things can creep in uh, to to even our utopian worlds. But um, the Klingon society is definitely a great way to examine some of these larger issues that we still face today in 2023. Um, and I loved that we really got to hone in on that, you know, very, very clearly once Laurel becomes the chancellor. A captain's log returns in a moment. Have you ever been tortured, Captain? Your English. Excellent. I'm descended from spies. Languages are useful, particularly when it comes to understanding those who seek to destroy the Klingon Empire. Little old me. You've been busy these past three weeks, Captain Lorca. It was you who first surprised us in the Korvan system. Appearing out of nowhere, and then disappearing without a trace. Undetectable, like a ghost. No other Starfleet vessel can do that. What is your vessel's secret? I have no idea what you're talking about. You suffer from extreme photosensitivity. Oh, we all got something, honey. You're sick and solace in the arms of a human male. We don't even have the right number of organs for you. What? Now he's being sent to them. How strange space must look to you now, seen through those damaged eyes. A cosmos full of agonizing light. Another creature might have slunk back into the darkness. But not you. You seek glory. Perhaps you realize glory must be earned through sacrifice and pain. Welcome back to A Captain's Log. Lily and I are in the middle of a great conversation with Mary Chifo. There were definitely some badass fight scenes for you in Discovery. Were there any added challenges due to the heavy Klingon makeup and costume for your character? So... I love that I got to embody all of that, but that also in that final costume, which was uh, as someone who grew up obsessed with Wicked, like I was like, this is my Alphaba costume, <laughs> like, <laughs> like act two Alphaba on the on the podium. Um, but that she was, you had this, you know, more conservative look that we kind of pulled through when I uh, did return later in the season uh, with some red splashed in, but just keeping that, you know, she has chosen to embody this archetype much like queen elizabeth did queen elizabeth the yeah. first uh, that was a huge inspiration for me in this in that episode you know queen elizabeth also the story of hepchatsut who is an egyptian pharaoh um a woman who you know through various circumstances did become pharaoh and uh once she uh died somebody in her family just decided to destroy all of the images of her because she embodied the pharaoh imagery as opposed to like, you know, a queen imagery. Um, so just really for me creatively as an actor wanting to channel these stories of these women who have unfortunately been erased from our history quite often. A Captain's Log returns in a moment. Welcome back to A Captain's Log. Lily and I are thrilled to be bringing you this extended interview with Mary Chifo, part three. Elkar says information on your screen we're showing you right now on Mary's acting career, Star Trek, and so much more. Her character, Laurel, has ascended to Chancellor of the Klingon High Council in the mighty Klingon Empire. Check out these facts. <music> And anyone, it, I mean, certainly we're in this, you know, historical moment of examining righteousness, I think. I mean, I feel like, we unfortunately, are. history 
we've often been in this place this, you know the seeds of why trek came about in the first place is you know roddenberry wanted us to examine um some of the philosophies we were holding and, and the way in which we defined enemies and, and the klingons specifically just that Klingons are a sensual, sentient being. Yes. And that's how she's trying to draw him out. And it, from a human perspective, it's very predatory. Like it feels, um, but to me, I mean, like that's an intense examination. Um, and, you know, I, it's amazing to have that on a, on a show. But it's complex and we can't just take it at surface level and right. we have to have conversations about it, which is the kind of art I want to create and be a part of is one that makes us reflect on these larger um, things that we've come to accept. And again, I think it's it's hugely a, a feminist um, conversation, you know, an examination of how we uh, view women and their sexuality. Mary, this was so much fun for me and yes, for Brian. And, absolutely. Oh. So much fun for both of us getting to know you, Mary. Thank you so much for sharing and contributing to positivity in our society. And thank you for being with us here on A Captain's Log. Thank you. I'm I'm so thrilled to do this. And really, it just getting to speak to these things in such depth, it, it, it reinvigorates my like <laughs> passion for everything. So it's just really wonderful to talk with two smart, passionate humans who, who care. Thank you, Mary. Wow, quite the show that we've had this week. Trekkies, be sure to join us next week for another exciting interview and more Star Trek news. Bye for now. Yourself into a human I can depend on to bring me happy. 